Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma bada habata fillah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continue on in the Book of Marriage In Buluga Maram We've reached chapter 11 The chapter of Al-Iddah والإحداد وإستبراه وغير ذلك. This is the chapter of the عدة, which is the waiting period. الإحداد, الإستبراه, and other pertinent affairs or pertinent matters pertaining to the waiting period with regards to a woman uh, getting remarried after divorce or after the death of her husband or if she is a slave girl. So first, it's imperative that we look at some of these terminologies so we have an understanding. Al-Idda, the Idda or the waiting period, is a period of waiting in which a woman is not allowed to remarry after the death of her husband or divorce. There are three kinds of Idda. There is the idda of birth, the idda of menses, and idda of months. For a pregnant woman, in either case, death of the husband or divorce, her idda is up to the birth of the child. For example, she is divorced or her husband dies today, for example, and the next day she gives birth to a child. Her idda ends with the birth of the child. Uh, she is allowed to remarry at any time, meaning after she, after the Edda has passed, but as long as she is not free uh, from the post-child birth bleeding, it is not proper to have sexual intercourse with her. So this shows us about the Edda for the woman who, uh, or the waiting period for the woman who is pregnant. And... In mentioning those three kinds of idda, so we said the idda of birth, so this would be the idda of the for the childbirth, meaning a woman is pregnant. Uh, the idda of menses, and this has to do with the 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 waiting period uh, after divorce, in which a woman, uh, you know, does not become eligible to marry someone else until after this waiting period is finished and this idda is by uh, in accordance with her height or her menses from menses to menses that equals one uh, her her whenever her first menses comes that's her her first uh the first part of her idda the second menses the third menses and that is the fulfillment of the her waiting period and or the Idda of the months. And so as we will get into with regards to the Hadith or a Hadith in this chapter that refer to the Idda be uh, Idda with regards to the uh, menses or Tuhur according to Idda uh, measuring the Idda or the waiting period in accordance with uh, the purification time after the menses or measuring the idda in accordance with uh, by months. So, for example, if a woman has been divorced, how do we measure her idda? Do we measure it by months? You know, now 30 days has taken place to the next uh, high. Uh, and then, you know, and, and now it's been three months and now she her idda is totally finished. Or do we measure it by her, uh, the actual menses itself. So this is uh, uh, something that ulama have uh, disagreement with regards, and it comes down to the interpretation of the term quru, uh, which is explained in the Quran, or which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. And we will get into the, some of those issues as we... Uh, journey through these ahadith uh, pertinent to the idda. Uh, the second point is uh, al-ihdad. Al-ihdad 
This is observing of the mourning by a woman for her husband who has died. So, for example, a woman, when her husband has, has uh, passed away, then she has an idda. She has a waiting period before she's able to marry again. So there's a specified time in accordance with the Quran before a woman is eligible to remarry. And that is her idda. That is called uh, ihdad. You know, so that is the ihdad. That is in accordance that is the waiting period for the mourning uh, for the widower. And then the third term that Imam uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani mentioned in this chapter he is uh, istibra. And istibra is the time of waiting till one menstruation period has passed in the case of a newly purchased slave girl. So this is istibra to make sure basically that a woman is not pregnant so that way there is no uh, doubt about who the father is if she remarries or uh, what have you. That there will be no doubt or question with regards to the father. The first hadith and it's the 945th hadith in accordance with my uh, with my copy narrated Al Miswar ibn Makhruma radiallahu ta'ala an some nights after her husband uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, some nights after her husband's death Subay, uh, Subay'a Al Aslamiya radiallahu ta'ala anha gave birth to a child. So uh, Miswar uh, is, is, is the narrator. He said, Some nights after her husband's death, Subaya al-Aslamiya, it was her husband's death, uh, gave birth to a child. Then she went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked permission to marry. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her permission and she married, reported by Al-Bukhari. Its basic meaning is found in the two Sahih books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And in another wording, she gave birth to a child after 40 nights of her husband's death. A wording by, uh, by Muslim has, as Zuhri said, I think there is no harm if she marries when she is still bleeding due to childbirth, meaning this is the time of what the, the scholars refer to as the postpartum bleeding, or it is called nifas. Uh, but her husband should not go near her till she is purified. Uh, in this, these ahadith, there are immense benefit, and they clear, they give us the hukum, or the ruling, regarding al-ihdad, that when a woman, uh, her husband has deceased, it gives it clarifies for us about her waiting period, the hukum with regards to her waiting period before she's able to remarry again. So one of the benefits that are attained that are uh, gained from this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us the haris. Of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een, in uh, questioning, in that uh, Subaya al Aslamiya, she went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked permission to marry. And he gave her permission and she married. So this shows the hers or that the the uh, the way the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een were very serious and strove to ask for uh, Islamic knowledge and to ask for uh, to, to clarify things when they had questions with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen that they had they were very serious about questions. They weren't unlike us in our time in which we usually do things. Then we ask whether it was halal or haram 
whether we should do this or whether we should do that after we've already done the action. But this is unlike the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى عنهم أجمعين. And this, this uh, hadith illustrates this for us. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, shows us the permissibility of a woman proposing to a man that this is permissible in Islam. And that uh, this this hadith it, it illustrates for us uh, that very fact and that is because the father of Sanabil radiallahu ta'ala he uh, asked for Subaya al Aslamiya and engaged her. Uh, and so, in this uh, situation, it shows that it is uh, permissible for uh, both ways, for both parties to seek engagement. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is that it illustrates for us that if a woman's uh, if a woman's husband uh, dies and she is pregnant, that her inda uh, is over when she gives birth. So her inda is the duration of the time of her pregnancy. So as in the example we illustrated uh, prior to reading this hadith, that for example, a woman. Uh, she's she's pregnant and her husband then passes and she's pregnant say she just has one month left in her term that one month is the duration of her end once she has uh, once she gives birth that she uh, now uh, you know she is eligible for marriage her end is ended likewise even if it's the extent even if it's just one day even if it's just one hour so to speak so it lets us know that the duration remaining of her pregnancy is the duration of her idda for the woman whose husband is passed and she is pregnant. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the pregnant woman is, uh, uh, you know, that she does have an idda, that a pregnant woman does have an idda. And the idda, as we mentioned, is the duration of her pregnancy. And this is a very important, uh, uh, very important hukum to be aware of and something which is uh, very practical knowledge for us to have. Before getting into the next hadith, it's important to clarify and mention some of the evidence for, <coughs> evidences from the Quran, from the Kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Kalam of Allah, Kalam of Allah. And with regards to al idda al-Ihdad al istibra or al idda wal ihdad And regarding the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 228, divorced women remain in waiting for three periods. So this right here, this ayat here in Surah Al-Baqarah clarifies for us the waiting period for the idda, that when a woman is divorced, her waiting period, you know, her waiting period, her idda is three uh Menses, uh, three menstrual cycles or uh, could be uh, so three periods and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in Surah Al-Talaq verse 4 Allah says and those who no longer expect menstruation among your women if you doubt then their period is three months 
and also for those who have not menstruated and for those who are pregnant their term is until they give birth so that makes it clear for us those rulings where uh, where these rulings you know their asal and where their foundation comes from the Quran and as we mentioned from that hadith in the Sunday and we're going to get into uh, other ahadith uh, pertaining to this uh, so this also this concerns the cases of separation between wife and husband in life so those ahkam are pertinent to the husband and wife during their lifetime however in the case of the death of the woman as we mentioned as the hadith of uh, uh, al-miswar ibn makhrama uh, uh, illustrated for us that the hukum with regards to in case the death of the husband uh, is until the uh, the hukum as far as her idda, as far as her waiting period or her uh, ihdad that this period is until she gives birth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 234 and those who are taken in death among you and leave wives behind, they wait for four months and ten days. So that is the waiting period for the uh, widow. That's the widow who is not pregnant. And then in the case of the widow being pregnant, as the hadith of uh, al-Miswar ibn Makhrama illustrated, then that is pertinent to or relevant to that hukum is that it is uh, if the woman is pregnant and she her husband dies she becomes a widow then her uh, waiting period before she can remarry is the duration of the pregnancy uh, and a last point just to have some idea about the the hikmah or the wisdom of the uh, behind the prescription of the waiting period it is to make sure the woman has not conceived a child before separating from her husband. So basically, to make sure a woman is not pregnant in order not to let there be any confusion regarding the lineage of the child. Uh, moreover, this waiting period gives the husband the chance to uh, repeal the divorce and to take his wife back as long as his divorce is, uh, is revocable, meaning it's not irrevocable, it's not... Uh, you know the 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 last divorce, the third divorce. So this shows us that Islam uh, gives special attention to those important uh, wisdoms. That those wisdoms are a part of Islam. That the idda is prescribed, or some of the the wisdom, the main wisdom behind the idda is that number one to make sure that there's no uh, mixing between the uh, you know there's clarity with regards to the lineage of the child and the second wisdom behind the idda is that when it is the idda of uh, of divorce uh, this waiting period and where the woman resides in the house with her husband we're talking about the case of obviously a husband is is, is living then this gives them a chance, they have two chances to reconcile. So they have three divorces as we discussed uh, in the beginning of the chapter of uh, divorce. In the next hadith, the 946th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Barira radiallahu ta'ala anha, was ordered to wait till three menstrual periods of hers uh, have passed before she could remarry. And this is reported by Ibn Majah. Its narrators are reliable, but it is ma'lul having a hidden defect. Uh, in the case of Barira, her husband was a slave after being manumitted from slavery. As a free woman, she was given an option concerning her wedlock. Barira, radiallahu ta'ana, chose to have her previous wedlock nullified and hence she had to spend an idda of a free woman consisting of three menstrual periods. This hadith implies that the duration of idda thus spent is determined according to the status of the woman and not the man.
So this uh, gives us the, uh, uh, you know, illustrates for us that important hukum that the, uh, in the case of Barira, because she was a slave and she had a prior marriage, she was married in that, uh, that her idda, when she became freed, when Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha freed her, she had the choice with regards to her, her marriage, her husband, she chose to be separated from him. And so her idda was the normal idda, and that shows us what? That the idda is what? That it is three uh, menstrual periods. So some of the benefits that we gain from this hadith, or some of the uh, important benefits that we gain from this hadith, is uh, first that there is that it is an obligation to have the idda for three menstruation menstrual uh, cycles uh, for the woman whose divorce uh, who, whose marriage was uh, fasakh <coughs> and that means that her marriage was dissolved so it wasn't actually that she divorced her husband it wasn't a khula as we talked about the khula, but instead this was uh, fisk, uh, a nikah, uh, nikah, and so in this uh, situation, uh, if this hadith is a sound hadith, what is uh, illustrated here is that it shows that it is an obligation uh, in this situation that uh, to have uh, the idda for the three months, uh, three menstrual cycles, three menstruation periods. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us something which is very important about accepting khabar or news with regards to events and things happening. And so one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us that the person who was there and a witness to the event that happened, that they are, they are most knowledgeable about that situation because they were witnesses to that. And so this hadith illustrates this for us, this important point, and this is what Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, because she was a witness to the story of Barira. Why? Because Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, freed Barira, as Barira prior to that was a slave woman. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. In the next hadith, narrated a Sha'bi from Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, daughter of Qais, on the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding a woman who was divorced by three pronouncement, she has no right to accommodation or maintenance, uh, uh, reported in Muslim. This hadith shows us, uh, going back to the uh, initial chapter which we began to study and, and we completed, which is the chapter of divorce, that this illustrates the hukum, the ruling with regards to talaq. And that when it's a situation of irrevocable divorce, the what is the case scenario for the woman who uh, you know, was irrevocably divorced? That means the husband and the wife can no longer uh, uh, you know, come back together except with her remarrying and consummating the marriage uh, with the new husband, and then for whatever reason they happen to divorce, then she and finishes her idda, then she's available for that that initial husband once again. Uh, and so it's a big, it's a long process, and it's a process which has to be, uh, you know, not something taken for granted. Of it is not something that one can play with, as we mentioned prior to this. That it is not muhallal, uh, uh, the the type of uh, impermissible divorce where a woman marries someone just to make herself lawful 
for her uh, first husband, that that's impermissible. So we're talking that it has to have real circumstances, as we already spoke about in, in quite a bit of detail uh, prior to this. <coughs> uh, some of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us that the woman who is uh, finishes her idda the woman who completes her idda uh, she completes her idda with uh, she completes her idda or she or completes her idda with uh, with, regardless of whether this is the idda, uh, the permanent idda, or the other id, or another idda, that she, uh, you know, from th this is her third, uh, uh, her third divorce, meaning her and her husband are no longer married and cannot reconcile. So, regardless of the type of idda that she is on, that there is uh, once the idda is finished, that there is no nafaka, and there is no. Uh, there's no provisions for her, meaning the husband is no longer responsible for her, for her food and her shelter. Okay, there's no or, or her clothing. There's no more spending upon her because now they are no longer married. They no longer have that marital bond or that family family bond between them, especially when there's no children involved. Uh, so there's no uh, reason for the husband to provide for her any any longer. He is not obligated, nor should he, nor is that his responsibility. So that is one of the benefits we gain from this hadith because the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam uh, mentioned uh, regarding the woman who was divorced by three pronouncement, meaning that she finished her, the, this was the third time she had been divorced by her husband she has no right to accommodation or maintenance. And this is in Sahih Muslim. So this illustrates for us that very important hukum that uh, when the marriage is as uh, that bond has been severed um, without the ability to reconcile. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the permissibility of uh, divorcing uh, three times, that this is a part of Islam. Uh, and that's because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, clarified for us this hukum and likewise did not uh, disagree with it. So on, uh, aside from him agreeing to it or allowing this to happen in his presence, he did not, he also uh, mentioned in detail the hukum regarding that. And what was the hukum? The hukum is that no longer is the man responsible for uh, his ex-wife now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al karim at-talaq maratan, that uh, divorce is two times, meaning that the third... So that that the irrevoc the revocable divorce is two times, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "فَإِن تَلَّكَهَا فَلَا تُهِلَّ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ حَتَّى تَنْكَهَا زَوْجٍ غَيْرَ." So uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse two hundred thirty, that that if uh, the man has divorced her, divorced his wife, then she is no longer uh, lawful for him. And this is talking about the talaq uh, ba'in, meaning the irrevocable divorce. That means this is a third divorce. That means they cannot reconcile. Uh, and, and, and the reason we know that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُهِلَّ لَهُ And so she is no longer permissible for him. Okay? And that only happens in that type of, uh, in that situation, as far as talaq. Uh until after she marries another man. And we just mentioned the hukum, the details with regards to that from the sunnah is that she marries someone else, uh, you know, a sincere marriage, a real marriage, and they have uh, sexual relations, intercourse, 
and then they happen to divorce. Then she becomes lawful for her her uh, initial husband if he wishes to return to her, if they wish to rec uh, if they wish to get married again, and that begins with a new uh, marital contract and everything. In the next hadith narrated Um Atiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a woman must not observe mourning for more than three nights for the one who has died, except for the four months and ten days in the case of a husband. And she must not wear a dyed garment except one of the type made of uh, ash, which is a dyed yarn, or apply kohol, which is around the eyes, or apply perfume except for a little qist or uh, asfar when she has been purified after her menstruation. Mutafakun uh, alayhi. The wording being of Muslim, Abu Dawood and the Nisa'i have an addition, nor apply henna, and Nisa'i added, nor comb her hair. Uh, in this hadith, the hadith of Um Atiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. This hadith uh, clarifies for us, makes bayan the hukum regarding the uh, the widow, uh, the, the widower. And that, or, or the widow, and that the regarding the hukum of the widow that she uh the adab this hadith illustrates for us the adab and the manners that she should observe when her husband uh becomes her husband dies likewise this hadith also is a clarification of who the ihdad uh ihdad is for who this waiting period is for or the permissibility of mourning uh, so this hadith deals with uh, several important key issues. Uh, the first issue regarding this hadith is this hadith shows us that that it is uh, impermissible for a woman to mourn f for anyone except for her husband for more for more than three days meaning that a woman can mourn for up to three days for example her her father her brother her mother her aunt her sister uncle whatever the case may be uh up to three days after three days it's impermissible for her to uh to do these customs and the reason that being uh, what where we find that is from the nas because the Prophet والسلام, said a woman must not observe mourning for more than three nights for one who has died and then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except for the four months and ten days uh, in the uh, case of the husband meaning that the husband is passed so this shows us the hukum of uh, with regards to mourning for, for the women that it uh, that more than three days is impermissible except in the case of her husband passing and the Prophet وسلم, in the hadith illustrated what the uh, amount of time that the the waiting period or in the morning that it takes place and he وسلم, said except for the four months in ten days in the case of the husband another benefit of this hadith this hadith shows us the ease of the shirk the taysir of the shar, that the sharia uh, gives uh, that leeway for a person, of course, in their natural state, because Islam is natural. There's no way we could claim that Islam is natural if it didn't recognize your natural state, that you're a human being, you become sad, you, uh, you need time to heal, you need time to... So Islam considers that because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you, who created that natural state, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this hadith illustrates for us the ease of Islam. Uh, another benefit of this hadith 
is this hadith also shows us the uh, clarifies us for us that the the great right of the husband over his wife because even the father and the mother and the daughter and the son and all the other family members if they were to 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 die that they uh, do not have the right of being mourned over for more than three days whereas the husband is four months in ten days so that shows us that the right of the husband is something alim in Islam. It's something, it's a very great haq. And that shows us the importance of studying this chapter that we're in, the chapter of marriage, and uh, the book of marriage, and understanding these ahkam. And this hadith is just one of the hadith of, amongst the many which illustrates that the right of the husband is very great over his wife, that it's an important right uh, that should be respected and fulfilled bi'idnillah. Another benefit of this hadith uh, is it also shows the impermissibility of the woman who is in mourning to of wearing uh, you know beautified clothing. So it's not a celebration. Unlike other cultures, some pagan cultures, and this is true, I, I don't recall if it's Malawi or one of the East African countries <clears throat> in Southern Africa or Southern Eastern Africa, Southeastern Africa, one of the countries that they have a ceremony in which they celebrate the dead. And what they do is they actually dig up the graves of their dead relatives and they dance with them. And this is true. You'll find this if you search for this. Uh, and look at all the mufasid from this practice of jahiliyyah, this paganistic ritual. From this paganism, this paganistic ritual of dancing with the dead, now there's been a severe, uh, an outbreak, and many people, several people have died there, and they're worried about it spreading to neighboring countries like Uganda and Ethiopia and other countries. From this practice, uh, spreading, um, I, I can't re re recall the disease, it's a very severe disease, and it's actually caused deaths. It's so serious because the dead, you know, their bodies are decaying, so you are now handling something which is decaying, bacteria, and, uh, you know, all kind of infections can, uh, can be the result, resulting in death, and people are actually dying. And they're so stubborn upon the paganism, People, some people have even been recorded, this was on the BBC, that they said that I don't care if it uh, affects uh, my health, I'm going to dance with my relatives. It meant that much to them, this ritual, this paganistic ritual, where Islam, the husband has th these rights, and likewise, that there is a... There's a um, there are boundaries set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are for your maslaha in this life as well as the hereafter. They're for your benefits in this life as well as the hereafter. And it is to the extent of that the woman should express her mourning, her sadness, by uh, not even beautifying herself. But rather the pagans do the opposite and they actually dig up and de decimate uh, the the sacredness and sanctity of the dead and dance with them and you know actually uh, become ill and leading to death because their rituals uh, are rituals based on falsehood. Those are just some of the main benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith Narrated Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, I put, uh, I put sabrin, uh, a type of medicine on my eyes after Abu Salama had died radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it gives the face a glow. So apply it only at night and remove it in the daytime. And do not comb your hair with scent or henna. 
for it is a dye. I asked, what should I use when combing my hair? He replied, you should use low tree leaves. Reported by Abu Dawood and Nisai, its chain of narrators is Hassan. It's a good chain of narrators. So this hadith illustrates for us some of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us that it's permissible to use uh, sabrin, uh, sabr, uh, which I believe is uh, aloe, I believe it's aloe uh, for kohol, to, to use around the eyes, that that's permissible to do that uh, at night if there is a, uh, you know, uh, some need for doing so. And this is at night. But the permission is not given for the day because the Prophet والسلام, said uh, he gives a face a glow, so apply it only at night and remove it in the daytime. So the Prophet وسلم, clarified for us the hukum regarding wearing the kohal and this kohal that was, uh, I believe, which is uh, maybe aloe or it is some sort of uh, medicinal uh, probably plant-based, uh, plant-based, plant-derived ch uh, chemical, uh, which is natural. Another benefit of this hadith, is this hadith shows us the ease of the shara for the, of the sharia upon the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is, we learn from this hadith that when the sharia closes one door, it opens another door, meaning opens a lawful way to do it. For example, the sharia closes zina. It closes the muharramat, uh, you know, zina. It makes that haram, okay? But people have to enjoy, uh, they have a, a sexual needs and they have the need to procreate and all these other things and to enjoy one another. Uh... So the Sharia has closed that bab or closed that avenue, but it's provided the lawful way, which is through nikah. It's through marriage, that through marriage you can enjoy one another. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that from the, uh, the habits of a lot of the women, especially we find a lot of Muslim women in uh, in the Arab countries uh, and uh, many countries in Africa and perhaps even Asia. So really it's a custom around, around the world in many places that women use uh, a type of perfume to comb their hair. They use perfume, they use these scents in their hair. So this is from the Ada, this is from the custom. But during this time period, the waiting period of a woman whose husband is deceased when she becomes a widow, during her mourning period, it is not permissible for her to use uh, that. Another benefit of this hadith, uh, this hadith also affirms that it is permissible uh, outside of this time to use henna for the women. So during their time of mourning, they should not use henna. Another benefit of this hadith, which is a and henna is a type of dye that is used in the hair, uh, and put on the face and on the skin sometimes for designs and, and so forth. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it's permissible to, uh, that of course the woman who is mourning for her to wash her, her hair, to wash her hair and, and to wash herself. Those are just some of the uh, main benefits of that hadith. In the next uh, hadith, narrated Um Salama radiallahu anha, a woman said, O oh Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my, my daughter's husband has died and her eye is troubling her. So may we apply kohal to it? He replied, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no. So this is in Bukhari and Muslim. And this shows that this woman even had a hajjah. She had a, a, a type of need for it, but her need was not... Uh, an absolute durure. it was not an absolute uh, a full necessity but instead this was a a light need that it, you know it would have helped her eyes because her eyes were troubling her so even in that situation it was not uh, permissible so this hadith uh, 
is a hadith which clarifies the impermissibility of using kohol uh, when a woman is uh, in her during her mourning period. In the next hadith, so we'll talk about because uh, as this hadith also mentioned uh, similar benefits, narrated Jabir radiallahu anhu. My mother, my maternal aunt was divorced and wanted to cut down fruit from her palm trees. A man forbade her to go out, so she went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said, "Certainly cut down fruit from your palm trees, for perhaps you may give sadaka." or do an act of kindness uh, reported by Muslim. Uh, so, uh, in the first hadith, the hadith of Umm Salama, one of the main benefits we get from this hadith is, is that it is impermissible to, uh, to make, uh, to use something which is impermissible as medicine. Although the asl, the origin of kohal, is that it's permissible? It's something that's permissible. It was it was done, and 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 widespread in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam used kohal, but during that time of mourning, it became impermissible. So although she needed it as a medicine, she did not. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't give her permission. So from that, the ulama, the scholars, derive from that hadith that it is impermissible to use that which is impermissible as a medicine. In the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala the some of the benefits from this hadith is that it is uh, that it was uh, during the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala is that a woman that was divorced she did not leave uh, from her house that they basically stayed in their homes and That was the custom of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that sometimes uh, this hadith illustrates that at times, uh, obviously, all the Sahaba did not know the Sharia ruling. That a particular ruling may have been uh, known to one but not known to another. Someone who was a witness during a particular event or when the Prophet ﷺ was speaking about something had knowledge that someone who was not in his presence at that time uh, didn't, you know, didn't have. So it shows that some Messiah and some issues at times would be uh, unknown to some, whereas others would know. And we, we what illustrates this is because uh, Um Salama or uh, the maternal aunt was divorced and wanted to cut down fruit trees from her palm trees. And a man, and this is assuming that it was a Sahabi, Allah forbade her to go out. So she went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he said, certainly cut down the fruit from your palm trees and give it a sadaqah. So... One of the uh, benefits of this uh, hadith uh, that some of the scholars mention is that this hadith also shows that, uh, you know, when a woman has talaq ba'in, that her situation is different uh, as far as leaving the home. So although the man forbade her from leaving the home, but she had the irrevocable divorce. She was... Her divorce was uh, the aunt, the maternal aunt of Jabir, radiallahu ta'ala, and she had the irrevocable divorce. Um, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates us for us the difference between sadaqa, you know, doing righteous charity, and fi'l ma'roof, that uh, uh, doing uh, goodness, in that they are both uh, can be one and the same at some time. Sometimes fi'l uh, ma'roof is general, doing good deeds. Okay? Fa'l uh, ma'roof. This is good deeds. And 
uh, sadaqah can come under that. But when they're mentioned separately, then it shows that they have uh, uh, their implications are different. That uh, that it can be more general. The doing good deeds can encompass all kind of other good actions that can be done. Whereas the sadaka is 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 generally restricted to maybe mal to to wealth. Uh, uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that sadaka is not something which is an obligation. That it is uh, a charity which is not an obligation upon uh, a person to fulfill, but rather this is just out of the kindness of their heart in order to come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal and receive the reward. Those are some of the main benefits uh, of that hadith. In the next hadith, the 952nd hadith, narrated Furaya, daughter of Malik, radiallahu ta'ala anha, her husband had gone out in search of some slaves of his and they killed him. She said, I asked Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be allowed to return to my family. For my husband had not left for me a house which belonged to him, nor had he left any maintenance. He then said, yes, I agree. But when I was in the courtyard, he called me and said, stay in your house till the prescribed period expires. She said, I observed the period in it for four months and 10 days. She said afterwards, Uthman gave judgment in accordance with that. Ahmed and Al-Arba reported it. At-Tirmidhi, Al-Dhuhli, Ibn Hibban, Al-Hakam, and others graded it as sound. Uh, in this hadith, this hadith uh, illustrates for us uh, several benefits. One of the benefits of this hadith is that it is uh, an obligation on a person who estimates that something that something is going to be that they have an overwhelming sense that something is very dangerous and very serious could happen to them, and that they should not put themselves in danger. So that's one of the benefits we gain from this hadith that the scholars mentioned is that one should not put themselves in direct harm uh, without good reason. For example, obviously there are exceptions uh, in the case that you're doing something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is something that's legislated. We're not talking about impermissible acts uh, and, and people of, who are extreme or people go beyond the bounds and doing evil acts in the name of Islam. But we're talking about Islamic actions that if it requires, uh, for example, maybe you're in a war zone or something like this, some dangerous situation. Maybe you're in a place, it's not a war zone, but maybe there it's gang infested. And you know of a Muslim family that you're able to help. Maybe it's a woman with her children and you are able to help protect her or something. So this is, incur this is going to put you in harm's way. However, there's a greater maslaha in trying to help your Muslim sister and her children, uh, perhaps, uh, in, the, in this situation. And this is just a, 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 an example to show that there are some times when uh, that one may have to face danger or put themselves in harm's way, but generally one should avoid those things when it's not a necessity. For example, in the situation of the Sahabi who went out to chase after his slaves and maybe it was known that they were dangerous slaves or that they you know, were rebellious and they you know, uh, were, were fear or what have you. Uh, and so then it is putting yourself in harm's way in, uh, in an unnecessary fashion. So this is one of the benefits gained from this hadith. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that it is not permissible for a woman to leave the house uh, in which her, her husband uh, died uh, that he was caring for. For example, 
if someone has a house or an apartment they rent or whatever the case may be, that the woman, she should not leave that house uh, that the, that was, uh, uh, that, that her husband was, uh, her husband owned or what have you until she finishes her mourning period, her edda, which is what? Four months and 10 days. So she should stay in there. And that's another benefit of this hadith. However, there is uh, an important condition. And we also learn that from the hadith. And that is, is you know, if it is not something, uh, a situation where it's going to be harmful for the woman staying by herself. Maybe she's young by herself. She's never been alone. And she's very legitimately scared of being in the home alone. In this case, then it would be more... Uh, uh, you know, the, the maslaha, the, the benefit, would be in her returning to her father's home and staying and spending her idda there or whoever that she can stay with so she does not live in fear. Uh, likewise, along with that, uh, that scenario, for example, if the woman, uh, the husband didn't own, but he paid rent and the rent was was due is going to be due in one month so she only has one month left in there and then she she's not working she doesn't have the means so in this case ob uh, obviously she would leave the home as well she would leave the home so there are some exceptions if she is unable and this brings up an important qaida or sharia principle uh, which is and the wajibat tasqut bil ajiz that uh, those uh, obligatory duties, that they fail to be an obligation when one is unable to fulfill it. So if one is unable to fulfill something, then it's no longer an obligation upon them. For example, uh, for one who believes to make the hijrah is wajib, or maybe they live in a country where it becomes an obligation for them to leave that country and go to a Muslim country, to live in a Muslim country. Maybe they're being severely oppressed and they have the means or, or they're severely oppressed. So it's, you know, of course, recommended and perhaps in a certain situation, it's going to be an obligation upon them to leave. However, if they have ajiz, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, that those who are la yusati'una hilatun wa la yahtaduna sabila, that those people who are uh, unable and they don't find a way, they're, they have edges, they're, they're unable to. So that wajib, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them and pardon them, bi'idnillah ta'ala, because they don't have the ability to fulfill it. And that's with all acts of ibadah, that if one has true edges, they're truly unable to fulfill it, that wajib fails to be an obligation upon them. They're not going to be sinful because they are edges. They actually do not have the ability uh, another example, someone who's, uh, who cannot stand for prayer. They, they have one leg is missing. They are injured or whatever the case may be or whatever situation. So they have their edges on qiyam. They, they're unable to fulfill that pillar of the prayer. That doesn't mean they no longer pray, but they pray sitting or whatever condition they're able to pray. But they are edges on that qiyam. Their edges are, they have the inability on that act of ibadah. So we learn this from this hadith because the woman, she felt she had, uh, I just, she was afraid. She said, uh, my husband had not left for me a house which belonged to him, nor had he left my, any maintenance. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, I agree, meaning you can leave. But when I was in the courtyard, he called me and said, stay in your house till the prescribed period expires. She said, I observed the period in it for four months and 10 days. Uh, after, uh, so, uh, Although she, in her situation, she wasn't totally ajiz because the Prophet ﷺ was going to allow her. But then uh, he ﷺ determined or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him that, uh, that she was not truly ajiz. She was able to fulfill her waiting period, which she did. But in the case of a woman who is not unable to, out of you know severe fear uh, or some other situation where she's truly not able to do that, then, of course, uh, the, that 
uh, she, she will be able to leave because it's an obligation for her to stay in that house. But if she is truly unable to, then of course she uh, uh, she doesn't have to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not uh, put a trial to a person greater than the strength that they have to bear, than they can bear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مِسْتَدَعْتُمْ And fear Allah as much as you're able. As much as you're able. Letting us know that sometimes we're not able, we're striving. But you fear Allah to the extent you're able to, and then you have to do what you have to do. You know, sometimes you're forced to do something. Sometimes you're just agis, you're unable to fulfill an obligation. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that there is uh, no provisions, no nafaka, no spending for the uh, the woman whose husband uh, has passed, the widow. So the widow, she does not uh, receive nafaka uh, from the husband's spending if he did not leave it and, uh, you know, have that provision for her. So she does not receive nafaka. And she becomes responsible for herself. Those are some of the main benefits uh, of that hadith. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.